And that's the first thing you heard on the video. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. It's the very first thing of the entire semester. Okay, so, so welcome, to, okay. Not, welcome to Math 605. Um, so uh, besides the six of you, there are two students who are enrolled in the course but are not able to attend the lectures. So I'm recording all of them. Um, and then right after class, I will uh, post them on YouTube. And then on the um, course website that I sent you guys a link to um, uh, yesterday, I will post links to the videos there. Um, so uh, yeah, so that might help you guys too if you need to review something or if you end up uh, missing a day. Um, now, hopefully, we won't have any technical difficulties um, like we did last semester in six ten. Oh, you jinxed it. What? I said you jinxed it. Yeah, you and I'm not moving it. now. Yeah. I'm back here, so. Okay. No okay. recording from back here now. All right. So. <laughs> Anyhow, um, so uh, we'll just get all the goodies handed out. Okay, here, syllabus. Here, lecture schedule. Oh, oh, shoot, one of those was the original. Uh, it, it should be two, the, the, the syllabus should be two-sided. Okay, and actually I want to keep this anyway. So. Okay, so you should be getting... Two separate sheets? Yes. A okay. Yes. Um, no, no, no. Well, yeah, yeah. Oh, this is like if we're sending them in opposite directions, it just cause confusion. <laughs> no. I already have one Okay, oh, well, yeah. I need some. Oh, wait, I already have that one. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> they need it. Why does everyone have that one? Okay. That's the lecture schedule. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, that's the last time I hand out things that way. <laughs> okay. um, all right, so I'll just, just to take a few minutes uh, to um, go through this. Um, so it doesn't want to be referring to the uh, course website that I sent a link to yesterday because um, so you'll, if you've been there, you've seen that the notes for today are already posted, and I'll generally do that, and I'll have the notes up uh, shortly before that lecture. And actually, the notes that you have now, um, actually, how many of you printed those out? Oh, just you. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that um, will hopefully be on the material for today and Monday. Um, so I'll just uh, keep uh, turning them out as the semester you goes. Monday. Oh, you mean Monday? Because today's Wednesday. Okay. Yes. yes this, is, <laughs> this is a Monday, Wednesday class. Yes. As it says in the syllabus. Uh, <laughs> um, so, um, and then uh, as we go, um, like in, in, in each set of notes, I will indicate which problems from the textbook. Um, so this is a, a book for you people watching, um, and actually the author. Um, I don't know how you pronounce his name. Petunas. Uh, we'll, we'll go Petunas. We'll uh, was a faculty member here very long time ago, like back in the 70s or something like that. Um, so I guess that's why they use this book here. Um, and uh, on the um, assignments page of a website, I will list the um, homework problems. So fortunately for you, um, all you're doing in this class is homework. Uh, there aren't going to be any uh, tests. I figure the homework will be challenge enough. Um, and um, we're going to cover the uh, first uh, six chapters of this uh, book. And you can see in the schedule um, what's going to be covered on what day. And unless there's a hurricane or something like that, or some other event that causes the university to be shut down unexpectedly, we're sticking to the schedule. Um, so. Um, and uh, so the way it works is since we're covering chapters one through six, I'm just going to assign homework by the chapter. Um, so you can see uh, there when it's due. So that, those will be the cases where I collect it. But I'm going to be doling out the problems every time I finish a section. Um, so for instance, for, for, for this section 1.1, I've assigned a problem that has three parts. So um, after Monday, you would be able to do uh, that problem, and then I'll pile on more, not many more, but 
Uh, because there aren't terribly many um, assignments in the book anyway. Um, so I'll be listing the problems in the notes, but also on the assignments page of a site, I'll just list chapter by chapter here are problems for that chapter. So I haven't picked them out yet for the other sections, but those will be coming. So it would be a good idea as a section gets finished to just jump into those problems soon. Don't, like, don't let them all pile up uh, close to the due date. Um, so you guys are all graduate students. Okay, most, most I guess, um, new or semi-new graduate students. Um, so I think need to be disciplined enough to use that kind of approach without frequent due dates, right? Sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll see how this goes. <laughs> okay, um, and then the, the six homework assignments we weighted equally, and that is your grade. Um, okay. Um, and yes, there technically is late policy that I, well, those of you who know me in class, I'm probably not going to enforce it, but I reserve the right to, so uh, keep that in mind. Um, so um, definitely got to have everything in <laughs> by the time it's over. Um, okay, now, um, uh, as far as the notes, I'm, I'm going to be, this is my first time teaching this particular course, so I'm going to be uh, following the book uh, quite closely. Um, so, um, and so some notes are going to be based on that, but the notes will be a way of highlighting what's important um, in each section so that might be more efficient than reading through the whole dang thing. Um, but uh, in certain cases, like uh, for today and Monday, I'll be, uh, the notes will not have absolutely everything that I'll do because I may do certain uh, graphs and so forth that um, do not appear in the notes, but similar things might appear in the book. So, um, uh, but it, uh, it would be helpful to have the notes to at least uh, follow along from. Um, okay. So. All right. Um, now, as a uh, prerequisite for this class is the, our first class in differential equations, um, MAP 285. Um, or whatever first course you may have had, if, you, if, you, if it wasn't here, um, that uh, where you learn all the standard techniques for um, solving a, a single differential equation. So if I had to sum up very briefly what what's the difference between a first course in differential equations and this course. Um, hopefully this is showing up on the video. I might want to use a larger font size. Um, that, uh, so, what, so what you learn are, for the most part I mean, it's, it's mostly about solution techniques um, for a single ordinary differential equation and the thing is around here a lot of students refer to this course is just DE, just differential equations. But to distinguish, these are ordinary differential equations that depend on a single variable as opposed to partial differential equations. Next semester, um, we'll be offered Math 606, which I, I've asked to teach. We'll see if that actually happens. Um, we're getting to that. But, but uh, 285 in this course are all about solving ordinary differential equations. So for a single ODE, um, something of this form, like y prime, is some uh, function of so you know first order uh, ODEs or higher order ODEs, where you have like a second derivative or maybe a higher order derivative, um, where you're depending on a, y is depending on a single independent variable t, and then any lower order derivative. And, and you know, that course, start of first order, just moved on up from there. You may, and depending on the course, you may have learned other techniques like Laplace transforms or series solutions, uh, things like that. Okay. Um, now, by contrast, in 
this course, MAP 605, we deal with a, a system of several um, ODEs. Um, so multiple ODEs that are all uh, coupled together are still depending on a single variable. Um, now, I can describe it similar to this, but using vector notation. So y is now a vector value function of t, and the time derivative is also a vector value function. Um, and, um, and the thing is, we will be focusing mostly on first order, and that's actually going to cover higher order as well, because um, any higher order equation involving second order derivatives and, and, so, and higher up than that can always be converted into a first order system. So by doing this, we handle everything. Um, and that's something we'll come to uh, uh, pretty soon. Um, also, um, unlike a first order differential equations, it deals with mainly solution techniques. Um, for instance, okay, can anyone recall what are uh, like some of the methods that are uh, covered in a class like that for solving DE? German coefficients. Uh, German coefficients. What are some other ones? Uh, like, Characteristic equation. Was that like or, or some previous method? That's PDs. That's PDs, right. Previous method, wasn't that yeah. something? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. That, that, that's in the, our other second course. Oh, yeah, that's it. So you guys I are, say, I remember that name. Yeah, <laughs> that's, 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 that's PDE, too. You guys are, Where are we aim lower. Separable equations. Separable. So, I knew it was exact separable, equations. Separable uh, variation of parameters. Yeah. Very, okay. That's what I was mixing it to. Okay. Variation of separable. Okay, that sort of thing. And I'm mentioning that because once in a while, uh, actually the, the first homework problem, um, you're going to have to recall some of those things. Um, so, that, so that does come up again. Um, but this course focuses more on uh, analyzing the qualitative behavior of solutions. Because in so, some cases, in fact, some of the examples are going to present right off the bat, you may not be able to compute a solution at all. Um, some of the equations are, are just too complex. You can't use techniques from calculus or algebraic manipulations um, to actually solve for y as a function of t. But even if you can't, there's still things you can learn about how the solution behaves. Or you can try to compute a solution numerically. Um, I will get a little bit into numerical methods. I wish I could do more, but it's not that kind of class. Um, I really am the numerical analysis person. But uh, that can be used to graph certain um, functions that can give you information about the solution, even if you can't compute the solution uh, itself. So there is there's some discussion of solution techniques, but it's not an um, end-all, be-all like it is in the uh, uh, first course. And the thing is, you know, this is not the only sequel that this department offers to 285. There's also Math 515, which... Okay, you took, and you took, and uh, I think that's about it. Um, yeah, that also, uh, but that's more about, that's more of a mathematical physics course. Um, and it uh, deals with other solution techniques like series solutions. Um, and actually, it's possible that course might be going away. Um, like, yeah. What class? Uh, 415, 515. Like this, this semester? I'll take it right uh, only two people are signed up for it. Oh, I thought you meant like for good. I was like, what? No, no, it, it, it might go away for good. Um, we, we might fold it into 285. Only two people? Only That's two graduates? Uh, actually, no graduate students and two undergrads. Who's teaching? Oh, wow. Um, uh, Dr. Chu. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> but he teaches almost every year. Yeah, he's um, well, well yeah. that. One why? time. I did it one because time. Because nobody's taking it. Okay, so. Uh, well, I mean. Well, last year Dr. Zhu taught this. He usually teaches this, so, or, or or Dr. Tian. So. Cause and effect. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't reply. That might be a good idea. Um, <laughs> I don't care. I don't care. <laughs> okay. I've done. I've said worse. It 
<laughs> I know. Um, Thanks. So, um, yeah, so it might fold out in, in, into a, a 285. So, um, okay. Um, so, um, so, so now to start our discussion of uh, discussing some ODE, so I'm, I'm going to see how this works as far as the video is concerned. Um, if it's practical for me to move this back and forth. If you didn't need the textbook, you didn't put the textbook underneath the laptop and give you like a greater height. Oh, um, well, yeah, actually, I only brought this here to show you guys. Here's a book. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I realized that um, it stopped recording at some point, and I think I fixed it. So, um, what I will do quickly is. Um, so apparently, this is what was uh, missed. So I'm going to um, just point out this is the form that we have for a dynamical system. Um, y is a function of, as a vector value function of t, um, and f is a vector value function of uh, t and y. This is just n differential equations coupled together as a system. We can call it a system of ODEs. We can call it a dynamical system, whatever you want to call it. And actually, that should be singular. Okay. Um, so now that hopefully we're stably recording again and it won't cut out on me, I can move on. <sighs> okay. Um, how much time have I wasted? Okay. We're fine. We're not behind yet. Okay. Um, All right, so a simple example of a first order uh, of a dynamic system, and it exhibits one kind of behavior of interest, is a system like this. So x prime is equal to y, y prime is equal to um, minus x. Um, so what we can do is go ahead and uh, try to solve this. Um, so what you can do is just go ahead and take this uh, first equation, and we'll just differentiate both sides with respect to t. So x double prime is equal to y prime, but y prime is equal to minus x. So we get x double prime is equal to um, minus x. Now, um, it's, well you, might, you might recognize already what the solution of this equation is. You take the second derivative and it just negates it. Um, what kind of function has that property? Sine and cosine. Sine and cosine. Um, so, it, and if you didn't know that, you could use standard techniques for um, solving second order ODE, like using the characteristic equation uh, and getting the roots, and uh, which in this case are complex, and get the solution that way. Uh, the point is, we can express x as, I'll just write it as, um, I'll use x of t is a linear combination of cosine and sine. Um, and then what I can do is, um, if I go ahead and differentiate this, and I'm doing it because that's going to go ahead and give me y, so that's going to be sine plus b cosine b. But what I want to do now is express the solution in a um, more compact form. So if you think of A, B, as some point in uh, two-dimensional space, um, I can express it in um, polar coordinates. Um, so I can write as R cosine theta R sine theta, where R, the radius, is going to be the square root of A squared plus B squared. You may remember some Cal 3. Um, so now if I do that, I can write X of T. So I'll factor the R out, and I get cosine T, cosine theta, plus sine t, sine theta. And does anyone recognize 
this, what you can do with this to simplify it. Yeah, square it. No. Like, like you get a cosine squared to take that sine squared. Oh, right. No, but you don't get a cosine squared. Cosine just t, 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 plus t plus theta. No. Almost. <laughs> Isn't it t minus theta? Yes. T minus. Yes, it's the, t minus. the it, this is the difference formula yeah. for cosine. So it's equal to r cosine t minus theta. stuff comes back <laughs> to, to haunt you. Um, so, okay. And then if you uh, use the same expressions for A and B here, um, what you would get is, um, all right, so I have, uh, actually, I don't like that it's minus R cosine theta sine T. Yeah, um, it's, it's, it's not working out as, Elegantly as I would have liked, um, I think because I would have um, okay. So R um, cosine t sine theta minus um, sine t cosine theta, which turns out to be. Um, are using the difference formula for sine. Sine a minus yeah, theta, theta minus t. t. Yeah. Okay. Now, why do we get t minus theta? Hmm. Okay. Um, Because this can also be written as r cosine theta minus t. Theta minus t. Yeah. Okay. I knew there was a nice symmetry to it like, like that. So um, yeah, because cosine is an even function. So, um, and thing is, uh, um, choice of paper A B, that just by convention I could have chosen a different convention. Um, okay. So, so what we have is um, sine uh, cosine pair. So um, so now I consider this as a point in two-dimensional space. Okay. Um, then I want to plot this as a function of t. Um, what is that graph going to look like? What sort of motion am I going to get? If I think of this as a point that's moving as t increases. So for instance, you can start t from anywhere and just let it go. Um, what, what sort of curve would I trace out? Yes, it's going to be a circle. And what do we know about the circle? What will we want to know about a circle that defines it uniquely anyway? The radius. radius. What is the radius? Uh, and the center? Or the center. Um, yeah, the center's at the origin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah but otherwise, there would be a shift. Uh, extra oh, the shift. Yeah. Um, yeah, so what happens, OK. Um, now, uh, so, so if I start t from anywhere and let it increase, it's going to trace out a circle of uh, radius r. Okay, that's a terrible picture, um, but you get the idea. Um, now, keep in mind that uh, how t manifests itself, we have theta minus t and sine theta minus t. As t increases, what direction is the circle going to be traced in? Clockwise or counterclockwise? What? Clockwise. 
it is going to be clockwise. Yeah, because cosine theta, sine theta, normally traces the circle out counterclockwise, starting from here and going that direction. But because it's minus, it's going to go in the opposite direction. It keeps decreasing, right? Yes. Cosine theta and sine theta keep decreasing. So you yeah. first take the, this quadrant. Right. And then uh, yeah, so for instance, assume that theta was zero. Right. Then, yeah, you'd start here and trace clockwise. Yes. So, yeah. Okay. So what happens in this case is um, we get a uh, closed curve because of the 2 pi periodicity. And the term for that, we call that the orbit of, uh, of a solution. One thing I found a little bit irritating in the, looking through the uh, textbook is, um, well, several terms were defined rigorously, and others were kind of thrown out there. Um, and you got to figure out what it means. Uh, or the same term was used for, uh, or different terms were used for the same concept. So I'm trying to address that in the jargon introduced in the notes. Um, so think of it as your thesaurus, if you will. Um, okay, so, so this is one kind of behavior we can expect to see um, in certain dynamical systems. Okay, we might get this close curve that we call an orbit. Um, and in this case, it, depending on the initial point, um, we could get an orbit that's a circle of any possible radius. All right. So we have an advantage here that this is a system we could actually solve explicitly for x t and y t. You can't always do that, but we can still sometimes figure out what kind of uh, behavior we're going to get one way or another. But any questions about this dynamical system before we move on to another? Still recording, that's good. Stay. I can't trust that thing. <clears throat> okay. All right, so, so second example. At first glance, it might seem like a relatively easy system to work with. Um, relatively simple functions of y and x. Um, in this case, it is not possible to come up with an explicit formula for x and t, y and t. So just to get some jargon down, and this is jargon that you would have seen before, but maybe not in a while. I'm not going to use, well, actually the book uses F, so I'll go with that. F of x and y. x and y are still both functions of t, but it comes to function f of x, y, set equal to zero. Um, and this implicitly describes um, y is a function of x or vice versa. So, um, so what you can do is you can use this equation to try to plot curves um, in uh, two-dimensional space that would describe the solution. Um, you just might not be able to solve um, x and y um, and both being functions of t. So it, it's something that's still workable, but um, it's, it's definitely more of a pain. Sorry, my L's somehow have an effect looking like C's. All right. Um, you may recall a long time ago in uh, Calculus 1, we did implicit differentiation. That's for this situation, uh, when your function is represented by this kind of equation instead of like y equals f of x. All right. 
Now, as for how you get an implicit solution, uh, that's something that I'll get into towards the um, end of the section. It's something that's going to come up in the um, uh, first homework problem. Um, so I won't get into that now, but I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that later. Um, but for now, I want to get into the uh, uh, at least a qualitative behavior of uh, this dynamical system, even without having a solution in hand. Okay. Um, now, um, check one thing here. So I might need this after all, but. of a single parameter t. Um, so basically, it's a curve um, and essentially it's a solution of a dynamical system. So the tangent vector of a curve, which is just alpha prime of uh, t, if you plug it into f, happens to satisfy it. Okay, the definition, I use R instead of alpha, but um, it's the same thing. Um, actually, the, the book often tends to use um, alpha to represent uh, solution curves. I think solution curve is probably a term I most often use, but just in case these other terms come up, like in the book, um, you'll know if they all mean the same thing. Okay, um, so that's what we'll often be interested in. What behavior do the solution curves have, um, especially as your variables x and y uh, change. Like, what, uh, for instance, what happens as x or y goes to infinity? Um, now, a second important definition, and again, there are many synonyms here. Um, what I prefer a fixed point, also known as a Actually, it's all something point. Pick your adjective. Uh, fixed point, stationary point, um, stagnation point, or an equilibrium point. Yes, in one section, the book uses all four of these terms. Um, they don't really bother to mention that, that they're all the same thing, but now uh, you know they are. Um, now, this is not defined for any dynamical system. It has to be a dynamical system of this form. Y prime is f of just y. So notice there is no t dependence, uh, at least no explicit t dependence. Um, and I'll say more about this later. But this is called an autonomous system. If a function f does not depend on t, uh, we say it's autonomous. So this is autonomous because you don't see any t here. Uh, the last example also was autonomous. Most examples we'll see in the early going are. Um, like on Monday, we'll see when it's not. Okay. So if you have an autonomous system, a uh, fixed point is a particular 
points such that the time derivative is zero. So fixed points uh, can be quite helpful in uh, understanding the behavior of your solution. Uh, in the last example, the only time you had a fixed point was at the origin, x and y both equal to zero. Um, and any other, um, uh, and all of your solution curves were both circles um, of uh, radius r. So one natural question to ask, uh, or two natural questions to ask when you delete any dynamical system is, are there any fixed points? Um, and more important, can you understand anything about solution curves? How do the solution curves behave? And sometimes you can answer that question to a point, even if you are unable to actually come up with um, a solution. OK. Apparently that thing's going to happen whenever I get an email. I assume. <laughs> um, oh, it's from one of the remote students, I assume. Um, okay. Oh, okay. Just letting me know if I should watch the videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I will sleep better knowing it. Okay. Well, actually, this is better. It gives you more time to get them posted. Um, okay. Now, um, So before I get into fixed points uh, and also discussing behavior streamlines for this dynamical system, uh, so I'll repeat it here on this board. X prime is cinch of y, y prime is minus sine x. Um, now, hyperbolic sine and related functions like hyperbolic cosine, etc. these are kind of functions that are often introduced in various sections in calculus books I mean, the instructor encounters them, and you often skip them. Um, so um, who can tell me what is hyperbolic sine? What is, what is the definition of it? <laughs> yes, it does. Uh, but as I said, you probably were all in class, the instructor came to it, and it's like, eh, never mind, I'm skipping that. Is it the circle you... Are you talking about uh, Which calculus like, it? Um, it varies, um, right. or it just keeps coming up, and and then it's like, ah, never mind. So, so I can blame that on The yeah. curve is going yes. actually like this, right? Um, I mean, well, I, I don't know if well, you explain it right, but yeah. well, I, mean, well, I have the image in my head. It's, yeah, it's well, uh, or a different way to think of it is what if you take sine and cosine of complex numbers or imaginary numbers? Um, so a hyperbolic sine is of y is e to the y minus e to the minus y over two. Um, so what happens is, um, as far as a uh, graph is concerned, so it's equal to zero at when y is zero, and then as y increases, it goes positive. Uh, that's going to decay to zero, and this is going to dominate. Um, so it's going to exponentially grow. And as y decreases, it goes towards minus infinity. This is going to dominate because the exponent will go positive. But the minus here will ensure behavior like this. So it's an odd function. Um, whereas hyperbolic cosine is e to the y plus e to the minus y over 2. So it's going to exponentially grow in uh, both directions. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and uh, so hyperbolic cosine is always greater than or equal to 1. Um, whereas hyperbolic sine assumes uh, all values. OK. So the first question we can answer about um, this system, we want to find out what are the values of x and y where the right-hand side is entirely zero, so both time derivatives are zero. So what x and y values are going to make that 
half f. And this system is simple enough that you can focus on x and y independently. Some hyperbolic sign. Um, yeah, to, 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 uh, to figure out which y values are given. Would it be 0 minus e to the 0? What? Uh, would it be uh, if y equals 0? Yes. So that's the only y value you can one have. Minus 1 over 2. Yeah. 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 Right. What about x? That would depend. Well, now you've got to look at the other equation. Yeah. x equals 0. And? And 2 pi. Know, zero, one, every two two pi four. Two. I think pi does not work. No. Does yeah. It? yeah, pi works. Pi okay. works. So 0, pi, 2 pi, therefore, right. multiple there. all multiples of pi. Right. So k pi, uh, where k is any integer. Um, so those are the fixed points. Yeah. All right. Um, now, as far as plotting solution curves, um, really, um, we'll, we'll, we'll look into getting, actually, it's a homework problem to get an implicit solution of this. Um, the way to compute um, curves numerically is uh, you can pick an x and y, plug them in, and at least get a tangent vector. So from a certain point, um, so, plotting solution curves, it's very cumbersome, but from an initial point, x and y, you can find the tangent vector, which is um, your time derivative, the right-hand side of your dynamical system, and then that will take you to a new point, and then you can just keep going. Um, so actually, I'm going to call this first point x naught y naught. And then, um, actually, at least for an autonomous system, you can do it this way, um, which this is. Sorry, this. So that takes you to a point x1, y1. Uh, and then you evaluate f again. So um, so in this manner, you can trace out solution curves. It's only an approximation. Uh, what I'm illustrating here is called Euler's method, uh, the simplest numerical method for solving ODEs, and we'll cover that later in a chapter. Um, but this is a general idea. You, from where you start, the time derivative tells you which direction to go in. Um, and you can, uh, so you can use a computer, for instance, to plot um, a whole bunch of solution curves. Uh, actually, uh, in MATLAB, there's a nice command called uh, Quiver that can give you a whole bunch of arrows that define, that, that can show you where the uh, solution curves are going. Now, um, so what happens is, if I were to plot out, try to uh, plot how solution curves are behaving, we can start with a fixed points. So I can mark those along the x-axis, where y is equal to 0. So we'll take uh, x not y not to be any other fixed point. Um, yeah, or anything other than a fixed point to get something interesting. Um, yeah, because so what happens at these points, the solution is not going anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, because it's, it's going to be a hard time. Uh, well, no, it's so, gonna, it's going to stay at this point. It's really going nowhere, um, because if I pl plug this into f, right. I get zero. I get nothing. To, there's no place to go. You get zero. Right. right. Yeah. So it, so what, if the solution hits this point, it stays there forever. So yeah, we we should not be doing that. Uh, well. Now, but now we do, so, so we can start by plotting fixed points, but now we go elsewhere to see what else is happening. And um, so, for example, let's take a look at what happens as y increases. What if you're starting way up here? 
or way down here for negative y. Um, well, what happens is this is indicating the rate of change of x with respect to t. So as y increases towards plus infinity, um, cinch is going off to plus infinity also. So what's happening is up here, we're seeing a um, uh, we're seeing more and more rapid change, positive change. That means that so if dx dt is po positive, we're going to the right. So what's happening is up here, it's going faster and faster to the right. Um, now what about y? Y is minus sine x, but What's happening with sine? How well, how's the graph of sine x behave? Yeah, oscillates between, Oscillate between one and negative, one. negative, negative one. one and one. Yeah, so uh, what's going to happen is it's moving faster and faster to the right, and it's going to be bobbing up and down indefinitely, so it'll behave something like this, but it's just going to keep going. And the higher up you start, the faster it's going to get there. Um, so that's how solution curves behave way up here. What about um, down here? What's, what's going to be different? Y would be negative, right? Yeah, yeah, so down here, Y is negative. So what's happening to uh, X prime and Y prime? Yes, it's going to go to the left, because for negative y, cinch is going to be negative, getting more and more negative. So we're going to see the exact mirror image of this. It's still going to bob up and down, but um, it's going, as y gets more and more negative, it's going to go faster and faster to the left. How fast it goes just depends on how far down it is. Uh, and it's, going to, it's going to be... Um, bobbing it down, but that's um, also, um, if we take a look at, um, let's see, um, now there's one trend that we can identify about is, um, that I haven't really depicted here. Um, so if you look at your velocity vector, x prime, y prime, so it's going to be sinh y minus sine x. Um, but now, if you, um, let's focus on a direction. If I want the direction of a vector, I only care about the direction, not the magnitude. What do I do? How do I get the direction of a vector? More things to remember from calculus. <laughs> you take the magnitude, you find the magnitude, and you divide by it. You normalize it to get a unit vector. So the direction is going to be. Um, so this x component divided by the magnitude, which is the square root of the sum of squares, and then here we have minus sine x also divided by the square root of sum of squares, which is the magnitude. So the denominator here is the speed. That's the magnitude of the velocity vector. Okay. So let's take a look at this. Now, as y goes towards positive infinity or negative infinity, um, the uh, cinch is going to plus or minus infinity also. S minus sine x is going to stay between minus 1 and 1. So what's going to happen to this vector as, um, well, at least as y increases? So if, if cinch is increasing in magnitude, but sine is still stuck between minus 1 and 1, 
what happens to these components? What, what, as, as y goes to plus or minus infinity? Do the x component tend to go to 1? Yes. Yeah. And therefore, the y component? Will tend to go to 0. Yeah, because this is between minus 1 and 1. This is going to infinity. This is going to overwhelm this. So it approaches, well, depending on the sign of y, plus or minus 1, 0. As y goes to infinity in either direction. So what does that say about the solution curves? So, so down here, they're going to be a bit wavy because of a minus sine x. But what's going to happen as I go further and further up? If this is my direction that it's approaching me? It will go towards 1. Uh, well, the velocity, the velocity vector will. Right. But, so what is the curve going to look like? If that is this direction that it's going in, if that indicates where it's headed. Is it like a horizontal line? Yes, horizontal line. It becomes more and more horizontal and moving faster and faster. And here, horizontal line to the left. Then can we calculate the gradient or the, the, the gradient is not, not a factor here? Uh, well, um, well, like, well, in that case, uh, It's not really the kind of function. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so like, so it's it's going to one. So as it's going to one, it's gonna be more and more like you know, the behavior will be less curvy, and it will be right because more be, because you have no y component in your velocity vector. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. So so that so, so we have solution curves up here and down here. Now that's the behavior for large y, positive or negative. Um, what happens around these fixed points, and the only way you can really determine this would be, like, uh, well, um, for uh, smaller y, um, what, what, what ends up happening is around these fixed points, um, you get this somewhat orbital behavior. Um, I want to make sure my pictures aren't getting mixed up. Um, but yeah, um, and what, what, um, oh, actually that's not true of all fixed points. Um, okay. Actually, just every other one. So the uh, even multiples of pi, we get this orbital behavior near the fixed point. Okay. Um, but what happens here is we get solution curves that are passing through these fixed points that kind of go around these orbits. Um, and um, as you as y gets gets higher, then we start to get these wavy curves. Um, now that's something that is really we wouldn't be able to see from the um, just from examining the time derivatives, but if you were to compute these numerically, then you'd be able to uh, see this behavior. Um, so. So what happens is we go from having these closed orbits near here, but at some point they're not closed anymore. Um, so they're dancing around these orbits, and then they just start, start to separate, and you get these curves up here and down here. All right. So there's a lot of crazy behavior that uh, you can get, and I have five minutes left. Um, that's unfortunate, but um, that's okay. I didn't want to get too far ahead anyway. Um, okay. Um, any questions about this dynamical system? Um, 
I'll say a few words about one more that has a very different behavior. It's kind of funny how I always tell students at the start of the semester um, because students tend to be last minute about everything. Um, to tell them at the start of the semester, you're not behind yet. So keep that in mind and do your best to not fall behind right away. And now I'm behind. <laughs> But I'm not concerned about it. Um, OK. So this rather strange dynamical system definitely not one that could be solved very easily. Although in the homework, um, if you're looking at getting an implicit solution, um, and it is possible to do even though it might not look like it. And the denominator is this nasty function here. And C is a fixed constant. So, um, so the question is, are there are there any fixed points? Um, so what you can do is you can look to one derivative or the other and try to see where there might be where might be equal to zero. For instance, the easiest thing to do to try to see if there are fixed points is take a look at y prime because for y prime, cosh is never zero. So now you look at sine. Well, we know where that's equal to zero. Um, so you look at, so you, you must have, as a necessity, x is equal to a multiple of pi, uh, an integer multiple of pi. So that would at least make y prime equal to zero. But then you would look up here. And uh, if x is a multiple of pi, sine is zero. What's cosine equal to when x is a multiple of pi? Yeah, plus or minus 1. So, so cosine x is actually equal to minus 1 to the k. So 1 of k is even and minus 1 of k is uh, odd. So now we're looking at sinh y equal, plus or minus sinh y is equal, must be equal to sinh c. Well, sinh from the graph I have over there is a one-to-one -one function. The only way sinh y can be equal to, be equal to plus or minus sinh c um, is y must be equal to plus or minus c. Um, now, so, so, so the question is, is that actually feasible? Um, because now what you need to do is take a look at what happens in this denominator. Because if a denominator is zero, you still don't have a fixed point. So what happens here? If y is equal to plus or minus c, um, that means that cosh, one of these coches is going to be zero. Uh, well, or, or the argument of cosh. But what is cosh of zero equal to? Yeah, it's equal to 1. So what's going to happen is one of these is going to be equal to 1. So let's suppose that um, k is even. So it means that cosine x is equal to 1 and uh, y is equal to c. So what happens is um, this is equal to 0. So we have cosh 0, which is equal to 1. But cosine x is also equal to 1. So the denominator is 0. Um, the same thing happens if k is odd. 
then this factor becomes zero. So in other words, this denominator is a big old booby trap. Just when you think you're getting a fixed point from, uh, from enumerators, the denominator turns out to be zero there. So, um, and the thing is, if you were to find out, well, okay, what is zero over zero, how can you find out how it's really behaving? What technique from calculus have you gotten could be used for that? A zero over zero situation. Okay, so you didn't forget. Good. Um, so I won't do that here because I'm out of time anyway. But if you were to do that, what you'd find is um, these are not fixed points. Um, so the um, uh, so x prime y prime go to infinity. Um, so instead of having so the velocity vector being zero, you have a velocity vector that becomes infinite. So instead of calling that a fixed point, that is a vortex. So it's the opposite behavior of um, what we, when we when you have a stagnation where solution isn't going anywhere. It's uh, at this. What, what happens is, if you were to plot solution curves, that's actually what you would see. Um, is that you would actually see vortex is getting zeroing in on this point, and at the actual point, it's going infinitely, um, uh, infinitely fast because the derivative is being undefined. So it just gets sucked in like that. So it looks cool to graph anyway. Okay. All right. So, um, so velocity vector zero at the fixed point, velocity vector becomes infinite. That is a vortex. So these are two. Um, key behaviors you want to look for in any dynamical system. And it's possible that some dynamical systems may exist both kind, exhibit both kinds of behavior at different points. Right. Okay, so well, I'm out of time. Uh, but I will spend Monday going through other examples of uh, dynamical systems and behavior uh, they can have. Right. So that's all for now. So I can stop this recording. And you guys, I guess most of you are going to real analysis. Have fun. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not.